All right, in the previous video, we, get ta we talked about the internal energy and the first law of thermodynamics, and we said, okay, we're going to be um, we're going to be calculating quantitatively this Q, the value of Q and the W, and that's what we're going to really talk about, how we calculate the Q and W in a mechanical reaction. So let's talk about the Q first, how you're going to be calculating the Q. And let's take an example of an, a foam cup or a calorimetry, and this is something uh, you guys use in the labs as well to determine the, the heat of neutralization or how much energy a hot metal is going to release onto in a cooler water and stuff like those. But remember, if you have, if you compare a, a glass cup or a, a foam cup, they can exchange the energy at different rates because they have different heat capacities. So another way of saying, when you actually losing or gaining the energy through the foam cup, it's dependent on the change in temperature. So the Q in that particular case is going to be directly related to the delta T, which is the change in temperature. So when I go ahead and replace this proportionality sign, and this Q becomes C times the delta T. So your C is actually going to be the heat capacity for that particular foam cup or the calorimetry, and it's going to be a different value for different containers. And a lot of times you have to actually calculate it before you proceed on to the experiment. And sometimes they actually do give you this value. So if I rearrange this, this becomes um, C, specific, uh, specific, not specific, the heat capacity is going to be equal to the Q over delta T. All right, so that's the equation for that. And the definition of that is going to be just the energy required to raise the temperature of the system, which means in this case is going to be the foam cup or the calorimetry by one degree Celsius. So the units for the C are going to be either calories over degree Celsius, or sometimes you may uh, measure the energy in terms of joules. So it could be joules over degree Celsius. So either one of those units could be used when you're determining the heat capacity. Okay, well, what about a material or a metal? Okay, so let's assume I have water and maybe I have an ethanol. So if I'm heating both of those up, there is a good chance that water and ethanol will heat up at a different rate. And that's because their specific heat capacities will be different. And uh, how much energy it will the water or the ethanol will take in to warm up or to change the temperature is obviously going to be dependent on their masses. So it's going to have the mass, and it's going to be dependent on their specific heat capacity. So the, it's not going to be the C, it's going to be the Cs and then the delta T. So you can kind of read this equation as like an MCAT to, to make, it, make it easier to memorize. So the CS is going to be the specific heat capacity. And then your M is going to be the mass of that material, whether it's water or ethanol. And then delta T is obviously going to be the change in temperature. So make sure you have this equation uh, recalled and memorized. And obviously, you can rearrange this equation if you want to find just the specific heat capacity. And that's going to be the Cs equals Q over M delta T. So the definition of specific heat capacity is going to be the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of material by one degree Celsius. So obviously there is a difference between the specific heat capacity and the heat capacity. We don't really worry about the mass when you're talking about the heat capacity, but when you're talking about specific heat capacity, it pertains to a particular material or a liquid. So that's why we have to actually worry about what the mass gonna be, what mass you're using for that particular material. So the units for the specific heat capacity is going to be either calories divided by grams degree Celsius, or you instead of calories, you could very well be using the joules over grams degree Celsius. Now, you may recall memorizing a lot of constants for water, for example, the density, 
and other stuff but you also you also have to know the specific heat capacity for the water okay the specific heat capacity for the water so I'll just write that down here is going to be one calorie over grams degree Celsius and uh, if I want to write that down in the form of joules it's going to be 4.184 joules over grams degree Celsius and that's because one calorie is actually equal to 4.184 joules uh, so make sure you have this number memorized and a lot of, sometimes they give you those numbers but a lot of time they expect you to know a lot of stuff about water anyway so this is only for the liquid water obviously make sure you uh, uh, make sure you know the value of specific heat capacity for the ice and for the vapors is going to be different and you don't have to memorize those those values will be given to you if the question is asked on the vapors and the ice the water actually have a fairly high specific heat capacity and if you want to reread it think about this if you want to increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius you would require one calories of energy okay and it may sound very small value but you know that's only one gram of water one gram is roughly one milliliter so uh, you know if you want to increase the temperature of 70 kilograms of water you would need a lot of energy and that's why water act as in a buffer system in our body because our body is like 70 percent water and it resists the change in the temperature okay well let's talk about how you're going to be calculating the work now the work that's get the other parameter in the thermodynamic equation the value of the work can be calculated as the product the negative times the product of pressure and the volume so P stands for the pressure and delta V is going to be the change in volume so change in volume means uh, it's just going to be V final minus V initial and a lot of times to be honest you don't really use too much uh, too much of this equation uh, the Q solves a lot of the energies values uh, when you're doing these problems however when you take physics you will be using a lot of this uh, uh, work uh, equation as well but if you do have to calculate the work done this is the equation you're going to be using negative uh, pressure times the change in volume okay so let's uh, let's talk about how you're going to be calculating the internal energies at different points so first of all uh, the internal energy at a constant volume okay so remember your formula is delta E is going to be equal to Q plus W now what happens to the W at a constant volume well remember the W is actually going to be equal to negative pressure times the delta V if your volume is constant that means the change in volume would be zero so all of a sudden your work becomes zero and then all you really end up with is delta E is going to be equal to the Q and a lot of time you write that Q uh, as and a subscript of V there which means it's being done at a constant volume a very typical example is in a bomb calorimetry when where you have this uh, container and then that container uh, you don't really change the volume much and you it, you can measure how much energy can be produced uh, by burning uh, a particular food like you can talk about Cheetos or Lay's and stuff like those so this is the equation you're going to be using in that case and remember the OQ it, it, it's going to be either uh, C times Delta T because if you're using in a calorimetry then it's going to be C times the change in temperature and if you have a material in there then you also want to use MC delta T so we already talked about those equations and now it's all about calculating you know the change in internal energies so we'll have make sure you're familiar with these equations I'll have some questions that will be using these equations so that way you know how these questions uh, how these equations are used in those particular questions now let's talk about the calculation of energy at a constant pressure and that's also called the enthalpy change so the enthalpy which has a symbol H is actually going to be equal to the energy plus the internal energy plus the pressure volume work if I change that uh, within a constant 
it's going to be, uh, oh, if I change it with a change in internal energy, it's going to be delta H going to be equal to delta E plus P delta V. Because remember, we're doing this at a constant pressure, so writing change in pressure doesn't really make any sense. The change in pressure is actually going to be zero, so you don't want to write that term in there. Now, we also know the delta E is actually going to be the Q plus W. And then in that, we know the W is actually going to be negative P delta V. So when I just go back and plug everything in there, the delta H is actually going to be equal to um, Q minus P delta V plus P delta V. So your P delta V cancels out. And then that delta H is just going to be the Q. And since it's being done at constant pressure, we're going to write down P there, which means this is being done at a constant pressure. So again, this Q can be calculated using the, uh, this delta H can be calculating the, using the Q at a constant pressure. And remember, the Q is going to be either the C times delta T, and the Q could also be equal to MC delta T, dependent, dependent on um, if you just have the material and uh, if you have the calorimetry. And if you have both, then you've got to use both of those equations to figure out what the delta H is going to be for that particular question. Now, I do want to say a couple of things here. Uh, like when the energy leaves the system, like we have been talking about in case of delta E, the same thing can be said about delta H. If delta H uh, comes out to be negative, which means the energy flows out, So if the energy is flowing out of the system and the delta H comes out to be negative, then it's going to be called an exothermic reaction. So make sure you know about this terminology. And I'll, I'll mention that again when we actually do the problems in the, in the questions um, later on. And if delta H is positive, which means the energy is gained by the system, so energy uh, gained by the system, that particular process is going to be called an endothermic process. Okay. Now, I want to do mention just briefly the difference between the delta E and delta H. And uh, believe it or not, there is really not much a difference between the delta E and the delta H unless there is an, a big change in the volume. As long as there is not significant, so no uh, change in the volume, when there is no change in the volume, then your delta E is almost the same as delta H. And a lot of chemical reactions involve barely any change in the volume, unless if there is a gas produced. If there is a gas produced, that's when you can have a big change in the volume. And uh, if there isn't a big change in the volume, at that point, the delta E is not going to be equal to the delta H. And other cases when you're just running a liquid reaction where there's really barely any change in the in the volume, you can consider the delta E and the delta H to be the same. And there um, you can kind of use those terms back and forth. OK, so um, in the next session, I'm going to be talking about how you're going to be calculating the delta H in, a, in an actual problem. So if you have any questions, uh, leave the comments below.